The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. What I want to do is um, proceed where we left off. We're in Module 7 on reactive oxygen species. Um, I'm introducing you um, to the concept, what was the big picture. And at the end of the last lecture, um, I gave you a few introductory slides. But um, what we're going to be focusing on, I told you, was um, oxygen can be one electron reduced to superoxide. Um, superoxide um, can pick up another electron. They should have a couple protons here to form hydrogen peroxide. So these are two of the species we'll be looking at. If you have iron-2 around, so this goes back to the connection to iron homeostasis that we talked about in Module 6. Um, this is called Fenton's chemistry, and you produce hydroxide radical. So that's the third reactive species. And hydrogen peroxide in the presence of chloride um, with myeloperoxidase can form hypochlorous acid, um, which then can chlorinate amino acids or sugars or um, a lot of other things. So you get um, rampant chlorination inside the cells. So um, these also, this cartoon also has reactive nitrogen species. We're only focusing on the reactive oxygen species. OK, so that's what we're going. Um, and so at the end, at the beginning of the lecture, um, I wanted to introduce you, uh, and I did give you an overview of where we were going. We were going to look at what are the reactive oxygen species, uh, what does reactivity mean, how do you define chemical reactivity. I think that's a key issue. Um, and then um, what are defense mechanisms? against these reactive oxygen species before then focusing on um, the NADPH oxidases, which are the focus. Those are the enzymes that we're focused on in this whole module on reactive oxygen species. OK, so identification. OK, and, and I had put this on the board the last time. Um, we have. Just repeating what's over there, superoxide, um, hydroxide radical, hydrogen peroxide, because this is together, and hypochlorous acid. OK. Um, and we're going to look at the reactivity of these guys. These are one electron oxidants. These are two electron oxidants. So reactive species don't need to have free radicals. Um, they can do two electron chemistry. Or they can do one electron chemistry. OK. So a key thing to think about, and I don't expect you to remember the detailed reduction potentials, but again, as the inadvertent consequence of our environment, you know, 1.8 to 8.8 .8 billion years ago, we moved from an anaerobic to an aerobic world. We have metals all over the place. The question is, how do you control? Um, these reactivities, and so we need to think about the redox chemistry of oxygen. So um, oxygen and, and the details, the actual reduction potentials, um, and these are some of them given here, um, and this one somehow got lost um, from here to here, which is 0 0.94, but it's in a table later on in the PowerPoints, um, depend on the balanced equation. OK, so if you're looking at this and you really want to think about the reduction potentials, you need to count the numbers of electrons and protons and balance the equation that you're looking at, because the reduction potentials um, vary. But what you need to remember is the more positive, um, the more positive the number is, um, the easier it is to re reduce, the more powerful the oxidant. OK, so um, we're going to have oxygen. And in the first one, we have one electron re reduction. And this is the only one where the reduction potential is negative. OK, so this is a pill. It doesn't want to be oxidized. And this produces superoxide. OK, so. OK. 
Okay, and so this is one of the guys we're going to be talking about, and here's the reduction potential. This can be further reduced with an electron and a couple of protons to form hydrogen peroxide. Um, so I'm not going to write that out. Everybody hopefully knows what hydrogen peroxide is. Um, and this is the number that, for some, some reason, got left off that handout. And this is favorable. And so are all the other numbers. Um, and the numbers are actually large and favorable. That means they're good oxidants. OK, so more positive, better oxidants. And these are all relative. These are all biological reduction potentials relative to the normal hydrogen electrode. OK, so these are the ones. There's actually a table in there where you, you see the numbers um, that um, people interested in biological systems um, focus on. Now, we'll see later on that um, hydrogen peroxide gives rise um, to hypo hypochlorous acid in the presence of chloride. OK, but hydrogen peroxide can also get further reduced um, to, and this is one where I don't have the balanced equation, to hydroxide radical. Um, and so the number I have written down here is 0.38 volts. Um, but again, the numbers aren't so important. Um, and then this can get further reduced to water. Um, and this number is, you'll see in a number of the tables I give you, is 1.31 volts. So we have different states, and all three states, a consequence of moving from the anaerobic to the aerobic world, are, give you species that are called reactive oxygen species. Okay, And the one that's hard, hardest to form um, is superoxide. And this is the one that's probably the least reactive. Okay, But what I'm going to do is give you criteria for re a couple sets of criteria for reactivity. Because when people say something is chemically reactive, you know, what does that mean? OK, it depends on what it is reacting with. And so this, I think, is the real problem in the field, is that people really don't define this very well. And so this is why I think the Winterborne paper is so important. So she has a table in there. I'm going to have the table up there. I re organize the table to focus on what I want to focus on in, in this brief introduction um, to this topic and show you how they define reactivity. But if you're thinking about something, you need to define what the reaction is that you're interested in with any of these um, reactive oxygen species. OK, so, so these are the guys we care about. OK, and the second question I wanted to address is, so first we were identifying last time the, I, the identification. Second is a chemical reactivity. OK, and um, I've taken this, maybe it wasn't from her paper. I can't remember where I've taken this from. I should have referenced it. But anyhow, what I'm going to do is give you a simple table um, that I think is useful to think about reactivity. OK, so if we look at reactivity, we're going to look at the oxidant. Um, and then another category, category is going to be the biological defense. And the third ca category is thermodynamic properties. Um, and you all know that things can be thermodynamically favorable, but not happen at all, like oxygen, oxidizing glucose on the table. OK, so you not only need to think about the thermodynamics, which involves the redox potentials, and you need to define the sets of conditions that you're looking under, but then you need to also think about the kinetics. OK, so we have thermodynamics. So we have biological defense, thermodynamics. Um, and then the kinetic properties. And the kinetic properties um, are often given in terms of reactivity with a molecule called glutathione. 
I'm not going to draw out the structure, but it's a tripeptide with gamma glutamyl cysteine glycine. Okay, so it's a tripeptide with an unusual um, linkage to the next amino acid. Um, what do you know about glutathione? Have you guys ever seen that before? So it's a major redox buffer inside human cells, okay? Now, if you're in a microorganism, we don't, they don't use the same major redox thing, so you need to look at that, but all organisms have redox buffers. And as you can imagine, and this is why we've been, uh, we focused on with the mass spec stuff, so cell phenylation, one of the major tar targets of out of control reactive oxygen species is oxidation of cysteines. Those are, there are other amino acids that get oxidized, but the focus is on the cystinome and all the changes that can be made and all the signaling, most of the signaling um, through reactive oxygen species all go, go through um, cysteine oxidation. So this is a reasonable choice, gamma glutamate. So just let me write down, it's a tripeptide of um, glutamate, cysteine, and glycine with an unusual linkage here with a... Iso, uh, isopeptide linkage, okay. So the first one, the first two are one electron oxidants. And the first one to talk about is hydroxide radical. Hydroxide radical, you'll see by far and away, is one of the most reactive. Um, and it's dying to be reduced, as you can tell, um, by this reduction potential, no matter what the variation on the theme is. Um, and there is no defense. So you don't want to get to hydroxide radical. So there's no, no actual defense. And that's not completely true because in reality, if you have glutathione around, the glutathione will reduce this by hydrogen atom transfer. Okay, so an important component is the redox buffer. So glutathione, let me just write that down again because we're not gonna have time to talk about this, but um, redox buffers play a central role in reactive oxygen species, okay? Um, and so the thermodynamics of this, um, it's dying to be reduced. If I have the numbers right, I think, I don't remember what the numbers were. Okay, so the numbers here, 0.31, I have different numbers in different places. Okay, but anyhow, it doesn't matter. It's dying to be reduced. Okay, so it's a, a hot oxidant. Um, and then the rate constant um, for reaction with glutathione. Okay, so it would be H dot transfer. Um, and this is a bimolecular. Rate constant is 1 times 10 to the 10th per molar per second. So this is really fast. Um, and so if you've got glutathione around, your hydroxide radical is gone. We're going to look at another way of trying to define reactivity, but this is the way that people who are trying to think about the kinetics of all this are starting to do this. So, okay, so this is one. Um, the second species, which is also a one electron reductant, is superoxide. And this is the one, one C des described most frequently as a reactive oxygen species. And reality, it's not very reactive at all. It is reactive, um, but not anywhere near as reactive as some of the others. Um, and do we have a defense mechanism? We'll come back to this a little and I'll write a balanced equation. I'm just gonna list things. We have enzymes called SODs. And so this is superoxide dismutase. And I'll come back and write a balanced equation in a minute. Okay, so we have proteins that are devoted to this, but in reality, metals um, like manganese inside the cell can actually function as um, a superoxide dismutase at um, reasonable rates. Protons um, cause rapid dismutation um, to form hydrogen peroxide um, and oxygen. Um, this guy is also dying to be reduced, so thermodynamically. Um, this is a good oxidant, but th the key is thinking about the kinetics. And it obviously depends on the reaction you're looking at. The kinetics are going to be different with every 
small molecule in inter or a large molecule it interacts with, but people, again, we're using glutathione as an example, and the numbers that people report for superoxide compared to 1 times 10 to the 10th are now 10 to 1,000 per molar per second. Okay, so this is chemically much less reactive than hydroxide radical. Um, and even for this one, we have a defense, we have a defense mechanism. This one, again, is problematic. Okay, so now what we're going to switch to is two electron, um, two electron oxidants. And um, the one we're going to focus on today in the section of uh, what happens in neutrophils um, to, to defend against invading organisms like bacteria or viruses or parasites. Um, the major way that this becomes neutralized inside the cell is again in, the, in a mammalian cell is with glutathione. So this is a small molecule. Um, it also is a very strong oxidant, but the mechanism of oxidation is distinct, two electrons versus one electron. We're going to look at examples of this. Um, and if you look at the rate constant for reaction with glutathione, and again, you need to look, you need to really think about a balanced equation and the kinetics of all of these things. That's, if you're ever going to work in this area, that's what you need to do. You need to educate yourself about what the species are with which you're going to interact. But you can see from this number, under the sets of conditions, they did everything the same way so that they could compare the relative uh, reactivity of these molecules, 2 times 10 to the 7th. So this is much more reactive, for example, in superoxide. Okay, and then the last one, the last one is um, hydrogen peroxide. So this is also 2 electron. Um, and two electron, we will see that there are a number of proteins uh, that mount a defense. These are called, and I'm going to show you this in a minute, peroxyredoxins. I'll show you what they do. Um, what did you see? Do you remember the paper, the, the enzyme that was used in the, in the um, Carroll paper this week in recitation? To get rid of hydrogen peroxide, what do they use? Anybody remember? Catal uh, we use catalase. I'm going to come back and write the equation. So catalase. And then the other one, which we also talked about, but we didn't talk about the chemistry in the Carroll paper, was um, peroxyredoxins. And there are like seven or eight different isozymes. So we have a number of ways of dealing um, with hydrogen peroxide. Again, um, it is thermodynamically favorable to be an oxidant. Um, but as we've already talked about before, hydrogen peroxide is really not very chemically reactive at all. And so the numbers that they quote under these sets of conditions are 0 0.9 per molar per second. So it's much, much slower. Um, you see numbers that range from 0 0.9 to 20. But this has really important implications in the paper we talked about um, in the mass spec analysis where hydrogen peroxide is functioning as a signaling agent. We're going to come back to this later on. Um, and this for years made chemical, more chemically type people not believe that hydrogen peroxide was involved in signaling, because the rate constants were just too slow compared to the biological response out the other side. Okay, so this is sort of um, a superficial overview of the differences in reactivities, but the real take-home message is these molecules have different chemistry and different reactivities, and I guarantee you if you're starting stuff inside the cell, you're going to worry about these kinds of things, and you need to educate yourself about what you're worried about, okay, in terms of the redox potentials of these systems, okay. So there's a second way 
Uh, so those are just the redox potentials. Okay. So there's a second way um, to look at reactivity, and this is also, I think, in the paper you had to read. So the second way is by just looking at diffusion. How far this is within a cell can you still feel the effects of the oxidant? Okay, and so I'm going to say C PowerPoint for the cartoon. Okay. So I think this is a good way um, to look at this. And again, the numbers are, are um, squishy, but here we are um, inside. This is a, the cell. And the question is, do some of these oxidants get out of the cell and go to the next sets of cells? OK, and so if you look at something like hydro, hydro, uh, hydrogen peroxide. So hydrogen peroxide it's the least reactive from this criteria of kinetically, the least reactive, and it goes way outside the cell. Okay. So it diffuses farthest away, so that means it's the least reactive. So, um, so the distance is used to define reactivity. And again, this is a squishy number, but I think it's informative. Now, what you see here, so hydrogen peroxide, we just went through, is the least reactive. Um, but I also told you that hydrogen peroxide, um, there are many ways to remove it um, inside the cell. Peroxyredoxins, glutathione, uh, G, glutathione peroxidases, catalases, they all remove it. They all have different rate constants. Peroxyredoxins uh, account for, I think it's 1.5% of mammalian cells, and um, they're very important in controlling redox balance. Um, and what do you see here? Um, if you are in an environment where you have a peroxidoredoxin, what happens? This diffuses a lot less quickly. Why? Because the enzyme rapidly reacts with this molecule. So we know um, that the enzyme can react. I haven't given you that number, but we'll see that this number is on, instead of being a number of 0.9 to 20, is going to be 10 to the 6 per molar per second. So this now, something about the active site um, of this. And it's not SH versus thiolate. We all learn now, everybody's good at this, thiolates are the reactive species. It has nothing to do with that. Thiolates are always more reactive. Um, but there's something else special about these proteins that allow them to control hydrogen peroxide. Now, might, why might you want to do this if you have a signaling agent like hydrogen peroxide? You don't want it going all the way over here. You want to control the effective concentration near we want the chemistry to happen. So these peroxyredoxins play an incredibly important role in controlling the effective um, concentrations. And so if you look here within the cell, again, we're only focusing on oxygen, but both hydroxide radical and hypochlorous acid um, have very, are very, very reactive. Um, you can't go very far um, without having them react um, with something, and that, again, is consistent um, with the kinetic analyses that, that um, people have done over the years. Okay, so the, the take-home message from all of that is that um, these reactive oxygen species have different chemistry and different reactivities, and you've got to educate yourself. But some of these things, HOCl and hydroxide radical, are very reactive no matter what. Okay. So the last thing I wanted to focus on was um, in this section, which is basically the introduction, um, is the defense mechanisms. Okay, so this is the defense. And I already have listed um, what the defense mechanisms are, but I wanted to give you a few equations. You've already seen that they can be enzymes or small molecules. OK. And so um, one example we already looked at 
is we already we already described but didn't look at in chemical details is superoxide dismutase. Okay, what does superoxide dismutase do? It takes two molecules of superoxide. Okay, and they disproportionate in the presence of protons uh, to hydrogen peroxide and oxygen. Um, and these enzymes have a K-cat over K-m, the catalytic efficiency, on the order of 7 times 10 to the ninth per molar per second. So these are incredibly efficient. In fact, metals, again, manganese in solution. Um, in some organisms, they have a lot of manganese. They can actually do disproportionation, in it, but it's all about the rate constants. Okay, so this is incredibly efficient. These enzymes are in all organisms, um, and so they obviously this reaction is very important. So they don't want you don't want superoxide completely un, uh, uncontrolled. And there are some that of these enzymes. These are all metal catalyzed reactions. Some use iron, some use manganese. Some use copper, some use human, use copper and zinc, and there are others that use nickel. Okay, and they all have different properties and they've all been studied in some fashion. So depending on where the organism lives, they might use different superoxide um, dismutases to control the levels of this um, reoxygen species. Okay, the second defense me mechanism are the peroxyredoxins. Um, I think I have this one up here. Okay, so um, any of you that are interested in this, there are like seven or eight isozymes. They keep finding new isozymes. They're everywhere inside the cell. They're there at high concentrations. They're cl clearly very important, and they're controlling the redox balance. Okay, so they do react um, with hydrogen peroxide, but they also react with other peroxides. And they're controlling the redox. They're important in controlling the redox balance. Okay. And so um, here, and, and each one of these isozymes has its own characteristics. Okay. And I don't, you don't need to remember the details, but the chemical mechanisms are sort of the same, even though some are dimers, some are monomers. Um, it turns out um, they all have in the monomer, two reactive cysteines, okay? So one is called CP. That means that's the species that reacts with the hydrogen peroxide. So we have, they can be monomers or dimers. This is the protein. And so you can have a CP, um, which can react to get sulfenylated. And then you have a CR, um, which can react to resolve the sulfenylation process. So you're going to get rid of the sulfenic acid. So here, if you have a CR, I'm being sloppy here. In other words, you probably have, this is probably protonated. It's all controlled to generate the anionic form of the thiol, which then can form, in this case, I'm drawing an intramolecular disulfide. Okay, so this forms a disulfide. Okay, and this is intramolecular. Okay, so um, what, if we, what do we see over here? Over here we see you can form an intermolecular disulfide if the, the molecule is a dimer. Okay, so the chemistry is exactly the same. But sometimes it occurs through the monomer. Sometimes it occurs through the dimer. Um, OK. And then the question is, once you have the disulfide, so now you have, how do you re-reduce this? And you re-reduce this by some kind of um, reductant, such as thyrodoxin, which we will see um, if we get as far as talking about ribonucleotide reductase. So. Where have you seen these kinds of proteins before? Does anybody remember? So thyroidoxin, uh, let me, this is thyroidoxin. There are 
probably 10 different kinds of thyrodoxins inside the cell. There's small little proteins, as is peroxyredoxins, and they're all involved really in redox balance. Okay, so we can intercept the hydrogen peroxide. Say we want to get rid of the hydrogen peroxide fast. Okay, we've done our signaling, we want to get rid of it. You need to get something in there that can react with the hydrogen peroxide that's there fast to remove it. And then you want to reset your protein so it can react with another molecule, so you need a reductant. Okay, so these are the key, the first, two, of the, um, two of the four things I was going to describe in terms of defense. Another one is catalase. This is the one that if you go back and you look at the Carroll paper, which we discussed actually um, in class, um, these, these are heme proteins. Um, and these are distinct from the myeloperoxidase that we'll talk about um, in this section. Um, but they can take hydrogen peroxide um, and they can convert it to oxygen plus water. So what they've done is removed a putative reactive species. Again, how reactive it is depends on the environment and turn it back into oxygen and water, which are completely unreactive. Okay, and um, the fourth, which is used quite frequently, are the glutathione peroxidases. Okay, and this is the one, I just to told you what the structure of glutathione is, peroxidases. Um, you all know from the Carroll paper that you have a single reactive cysteine in glutathione peroxidase three. That's what we used as the model. Um, for all of our redox chemistry. Um, some of the glutathione peroxidase is actually use selenium. So there's the 22nd amino acid, is selenocysteine, okay. This is one of the few enzymes, as are thyroidoxin reductases, which are involved in this whole redox balance system, are selenoproteins. Okay, we're not gonna talk about those. But the glutathione peroxidases actually take two molecules of glutathione plus hydrogen peroxide. Again, there are many, many isozymes, and they can oxidize this to the oxidized form. So this is the reduced form. You have a cysteine, and this is the oxidized form. So you have a disulfide. Okay. Now, again, where have you seen this thiol disulfide system before? I mean, bacteria have these things. We're talking now, we're focused on human um, systems. Do you remember what happens in the periplasm bacteria? Do you remember? Did you talk about that this year? Oh, okay. So you haven't seen this before in the past. So bacteria have in their periplasm enzymes that control what thiols you have and um, the states of the thiols. So th this redox balance by this disulfide interchange, very similar to... Um, this kind of chemistry is everywhere, okay? Um, and the chemistry is pretty simple, but if you go from um, cysteine, okay, to a disulfide, you just don't go there. You just don't go there with oxygen. I think this is something that people get confused about all the time. Something, you're doing an oxidation, something has to be reduced, okay? So, you know, hydrogen peroxide is a guy, if you go through sulfenic acid, you can now picture that you can have um, general acid catalyzed, general base catalyzed cleavage of disulfide bond formation. So just because you have oxygen around and reduced cysteines around don't, doesn't mean you automatically rapidly have um, disulfides around. Again, you need to think about the chemistry of what's going on. Okay, so, um, so now what I wanna do is then show you sort of the general model. Um, and then we'll talk about um, the NADPH oxidases, which is the focus of module seven. So, um, so we're gonna, the general model is as follows. So you have an oxygen, um, and we have the N, um, we have this, um, sorry, the proteins we're gonna be talking about are NOx2 or another NOx isozyme. Okay, I'm not gonna write out the name. We talked about that um, in the last, recitation section. Um, this, these enzymes use 
And I think this is important because part of the redox switches that I think are underappreciated are the levels of NADPH, NADP. They play incredibly important roles inside the cell. So you have NADPH going to NADP, okay? And we talked about the fact, and we'll come back to this, that this protein has a flavin in two hemes, okay? And it produces superoxide. Okay, so this is incredibly unusual. Superoxide is usually an artifact of some uncoupling reaction that happens all the time inside the cell. This enzyme is a professional superoxide generator. That's what its goal is, okay? Most other times you see superoxide, something has gone astray. So this is a professional superoxide generator. Okay. And so what happens then when you generate superoxide? You can have SOD or you can have protons. So if you're in a place where the pH is slightly lower, uh, you generate rapidly, very rapidly, hydrogen peroxide. Okay, so superoxide doesn't sit around um, all that long. Um, if you have iron-3 around, could be bound to something. Um, what happens is the superoxide combines with the iron-3 to reduce it to iron-2, okay, plus oxygen. So superoxide, if you look at the reduction potentials, obviously, what does it depend on? It depends on the ligand environment of the iron-3. That affects the redox potential. Hopefully, you all um, know that and have thought about that at this stage, given the last module. So what happens now is the hydrogen peroxide can react with iron-2. And this is the killer. That does what's called Fenton's chemistry, which generates hydroxide radical. Okay, so these two guys, hydrogen peroxide and iron, now combine um, by what is called in the review Fenton's chemistry. Um, and I'm not going to write out the detailed mechanism of how this works. In fact, I think we still really don't completely understand it, but anyhow, um, you're generating this reactive species, hydroxide radical, which is dying um, to be reduced, okay? So this guy is responsible. It hits anything and it reacts. So it ultimately is responsible for modifying lipids, modifying sugars, modifying amino acids, modifying nucleic acid. This guy, because it's so reactive, damages proteins, uh, DNA, RNA, I'm not going to write all this out, lipids. This is the guy, okay, and that's described um, in the review article you had to read. And what can this hydrogen peroxide also do? We'll also see that the hydrogen peroxide, which is going to be generated inside the neutrophil, which we're going to be focusing on, the white blood cells, um, that are going to be uh, um, trying to take care of the bacteria or viruses. Um, and the, you have chloride. Now you form hypochlorous acid. Okay. So, so these are the kinds of guys. HO dot, HOCL are guys that are going to actually do, make, do destructive things when they react with things that are help, uh, help us to defend ourselves um, against bacterial insults. Okay, so that's a picture of the big overview. Okay, and so that's that. Um, and we're going to be simply focusing on two proteins. The first protein we're going to talk about is the one we went through in recitation, NOX2. Um, and I'm not going to write down that reaction. Um, hopefully you all know this by now. Um, I just sort of said that over there. Um, and there are 11 different isozymes. Um, and then myeloperoxidase, which both of these are found um, in the neutrophils, um, in the phagosome of the neutrophils. Okay.
Okay, so let me, so the chemistry that goes on with the NOx proteins are compli is complicated. So it's not just NOx, the NOx protein, we're gonna talk about the NOx protein, but as with everything, there are other factors that play a key role. And I'm gonna show you a cartoon with what the other factors are, um, but we're not gonna talk about the details of how those factors help the NOx2 protein uh, make superoxide, okay? Make superoxide in a controlled fashion. That's the key thing, in a controlled fashion. So um, we have a NOx protein. The only one I do want to look at is the NOx protein itself because we're going to use it not only in, in this lecture but also the lecture of NOx2 proteins in signaling. So the chemistry is the same um, in destroying the bacteria and in signaling, so you need to know what the protein does. So if you look at NOx2, NADPH um, oxidases, what do you know? Um, they exist in a membrane, and we'll see this membrane um, can be the phagosome, or it can be the plasma membrane, or it can be, I'm gonna show you a cartoon of this, a vesicle membrane, so they located, these proteins are located in many places inside the cell, um, but they all sort of have the same um, predisposition, so they have, so they have one subunit with a domain that has the FAD on it, okay, so um, if we're looking at um, with the epidermal growth factor, um, or if we're looking at the neutrophils, this would be um, the cytosol, if we're looking at the neutrophils, um, and this would be the inside, the lumen of the phagosome. Okay, and the FAD can be, is, what is the function of FAD? We've talked about this. It's a major mediator between two electron chemistry and one electron chemistry. Okay, and you've seen that before. Hopefully that was grilled into you in the respiratory chain. So in the respiratory chain, you have iron sulfur clusters or you have hemes. Here we're gonna have hemes. And so what we have is on this face, we have NADPH going to NADP um, plus a proton. Okay, um, this turns out to be important because that also controls the pH and there are um, voltage channels controlled by pH that you need to think about if you looked at the detailed biology. Um, and so this protein is GP91. That is, it's 91 kilodaltons and GP means it's a glycoprotein, okay? Um, and then you have a second protein that's also an integral membrane protein that's also critical, and this is GP22. Um, and so what you see is you have iron, you have two hemes, cytochrome B heme dependent systems, and these are, are gonna change redox state. Um, and the interesting thing is that these two hemes are completely coordinated. So where have you seen heme before that reversibly binds oxygen? We're gonna, we need to do something with oxygen. Oxygen is getting reduced, okay? But what I'm telling you is that oxygen does not get reduced by binding to the heme, okay? It's gonna be using this method of electron transfer that we talked about. So they gotta be close enough so you can do electron transfer, perhaps through the heme edge in the protein. So ultimately, oxygen is getting converted into superoxide, um, not by direct binding. To the heme, okay, so this is distinct and we'll see, this is completely distinct from the myeloperoxidase. This is completely distinct from the P450s we alluded to when we were talking about um, cholesterol homeostasis. And the key that makes all of this work is that it can form complexes with other proteins. Okay, so let me just tell you what those other proteins are, and that was described in some detail. Um, 
in the reading. Um, so we're going to have a GTPase. RAC2 is a G protein. Okay, so G proteins can mediate phosphorylations. This one mediates phosphorylations. Um, and it is, remains in the inhibited state till you need to trigger off your signaling cascade um, by another protein. The, the nomenclature is horrible, but there's an inhibitor protein that binds to the G protein, making it inactive. When some sensor comes in, they dissociate, and then the G protein can function. And we're going to look at that kind of signaling. We already have looked at that kind of signaling in the um, Carroll paper, but we'll look at it again in the um, signaling by NOx. The second group of proteins, again, they're based on the size. These were identified a long time ago. They're unique to the um, phagosome. They're called phagosome oxidases. That's going to be the organelle where we're going to kill the bacteria. Um, and so this P47 needs to be phosphorylated, and it's phosphorylated by the G protein. And that's key to have everything come together to allow the chemistry to happen. So this chemistry, in this form, it's inactive. It's only when everything comes together um, that you actually um, start doing the chemistry that's going to help us. OK. So here's the model. Um, so here's a resting cell. This is the nucleus. Um, here, the blue thing is the NOx protein, OK? Um, and the little, the little blue thing is the second subunit. Um, so this is the 91, this is the 22. Here we can see that it's located in the plasma membrane. That's one of its locations. That's not the predominant location in the resting state. The predominant location apparently is in little vesicles within these neutrophils, the white blood cells that are the first defenders against invasion by bacterial systems. Um, and then we have these little complexes. Um, here's RAC2, a GTPase that's inhibited. Um, and here is the um, phagosome oxidase, OK? Um, and then what happens when the bacteria comes in, um, somehow the bacteria is coming in over here. It gets engulfed, and you form these little phagosomes inside the cell, OK? And now what happens is the NADPH, the NOx proteins are located like this. The NADPH is on the outside. It's been activated. Um, by this GTPase, um, and now it's ready to generate superoxide inside the cell. Okay, so there's a lot of membrane fusion and reorganization. Obviously, the signaling is really complex. We know a lot about the signaling. How do these guys even know there's a bacteria out there? Okay, how do they sense all of that? Um, and I don't know if this is going to work, but you should. This is a, sort of a cool picture of it. If it does work, although it worked in my office, but it might not work here. Oh, here it goes. So here we are. This is a white blood cell. These are red blood cells. The bacteria, these little things floating around, is sending off a signal. The white blood cell is chasing the bacteria. OK? So there's some sequence. It's chasing it through all of these cells. And you're going to see that in a minute, it gets it. There it goes, gets inside. So now in the phagosome, and poof, everything disappears. And that is really what's going on in these systems. So the question is, it's a really cool picture. The question is, what's the chemistry that's actually going on in these systems? OK. So the chemistry, whoops, somehow I lost. I'm already over. <laughs> the chemistry is all over already. Um, what we'll do <laughs> next time is come back and talk about how this flavin works. And then we'll see in that little phagosome also is the myeloperoxidase. We'll talk about how that works. And those are the two things I want. How do they degrade this bacteria once they get inside this little um, organelle?